Welcome to Deputy Star Killing. How are you doing today? We are going to be reading a story, but first up, we are going to be reading the Bible. The Bible. Then we are going to be doing the weird synopsis, then Kimberly synopsis. And then we are going to be reading The Hobbit. And I know it's backwards for you, but still. We are going to be finishing this today. And I hope you guys enjoy. We are doing two live streams today. It is daytime right now. One. Hi, Becca. Yay. Um, it is one. Ten. But I hope you guys enjoy this video. Make sure to hit the like button, subscribe, and hit the bell. Never miss another video. Here's the Bible reading time with my dad. Have you? Mm -hmm. Hi. So, what are we doing today? Oh my goodness, two live streams. What are we going to do? All right, so, um, first we're going to read Luke chapter 16. And then we're in in these two live streams. We're gonna finish the Hobbit, just like JJ said. So um, I thought that was better than me to uh, just endure on my in between time between ranges. So uh, that I'm gonna have Monday night. Um, I thought that would be a better, uh, more predictable scenario. So <clears throat> here we are. I'm going to go ahead and get started. This is Luke chapter 16. This is the English Standard Version of the Holy Scripture. He also said to his disciples, excuse me, I already made a mistake. He also said to the disciples, there was a rich man who had a manager and charges were brought to him that this man was wasting his possessions. And he called him and said to him, what is this that I hear about you? Turn in the account of your management, for you can no longer be manager. And the manager said to himself, What shall I do, since my master is talk t taking the management away from me? I am not strong enough to dig, and I am ashamed to beg. I have decided what to do, so that when I am removed from management, people may receive me into their houses. So summoning his master's debtors one by one, he said to the first, How much do you owe my master? He said, A hundred measures of oil. He said to him, Take your bill and sit down quickly and write fifty. Then he said to another, And how much do you owe? He said, A hundred measures of wheat. He said to him, Take your bill and write eighty. The master commended the dishonest manager for his shrewdness, for the sons of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than the son of, sons of light. And I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of unrighteous wealth, so that when it fails, they may receive you into the eternal dwellings. One who is faithful in a very little is also faithful in much, and one who is dishonest in a very little is also dishonest in much. If then you have not been faithful in the unrighteous wealth, who will entrust you to the true riches? And if you have not been faithful in that which is another's, who will give you that which is your own? No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. The Pharisees, who were lovers of money, heard all these things, and they ridiculed him. And he said to them, You are... You are those who justify yourselves before men, but God knows your hearts. For what is exalted among men is an abomination to the sight of God. The law of the prophets were until John. Since then, the good news of the kingdom of God is preached, and everyone forces his way into it. But it is easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one dot of the law to become void." Everyone who divorces his wife and marries another woman commits adultery, and he who marries a woman divorced from her husband commits adultery. There was a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen, and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate was laid a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. 
Moreover, even the dogs came and licked his sores. The poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried, and in Hades, being in torment, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. And he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in anguish in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, remember that you in your lifetime received your good things, and Lazarus in like manner bad things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in anguish. And besides all this, between us, you... Between us and you, a great chasm has been fixed, in order that those who would pass from here to you may not be able, and none may cross from there to us. And he said, Then I beg you, Father, to send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, so that he may warn them, lest they also come into this place of torment. But Abraham said, They have Moses, and they have and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. He said to them, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. And that is the reading of the scripture. That um, passage of scripture always reminds me of the song that I think probably every high school choir sang at one time or another. I might try to find a YouTube video of that and post a link to it. Um, in the next uh, day or so, um, maybe this afternoon, so um, so that everybody can watch that and listen to it. Um, I don't want to try to sing it right now because I'll probably mess it up. So, <clears throat> the last thing that just happened, um, the the people in Lake Town, they came up to the mountain. And they were uh, kind of chilling out with the elves and stuff, and they just kind of walked up to the walked up the mountain, and they said, "Hey, Thorin, um, since you're such a nice um, dwarf, uh, we're wondering if you just you know kind of let us have our share of the profits. You know, we've got this dude named named uh, Bard who who was the actual killer of the dragon and." Maybe he should get, you know, at least, like, his fair share. And Thorin basically said, you know what, you can have everything. Once I find the Arkenstone, it's all yours. I think Kimberly has something different to share. Here she comes. I did say we were going to the good synopsis. It's the false synopsis. So what actually happened was they did go up asked for Bard to have his fair share of the treasure and everything, except Thorin, he decided he wanted to be grumpy. So he's like, no, you guys can't, because I don't like the elves and blah, blah, blah. Because they imprisoned me, which is actually a pretty good reason not to like them. And then, um, and then he's like, as long as you keep coming here armed, I'm going to treat you as enemies. So Which I think is also pretty fair, honestly. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, then what happened after that is they came over with Bard this time, and he basically laid out what he, what he wanted, mm. said um, that he wanted a part of the treasure, and that he killed the dragon and everything. And then, um, I think... Thorin shot arrows at him. And everybody else is like, you know, we probably should just give them some of the gold and get over it. Well, not everybody. I think most of the dwarves were on Thorin's side, but it was Feely and Keely and Bomber. And Bilbo didn't want anything to do with it. Right. Some of the dwarves, at least. And most of them agreed with Thorin. And were like, all this treasure is ours because most of it was... Our ancestors' treasure, so it should be ours now. And forgive my messed up hair. Um, I brushed it, but it's humid today. I'm going to hand it off to Dad. And, yeah. 
So now we have the chapter. Ooh, there's three people on. Who's our third person? Wow, that's exciting. Okay. Maybe it is Granny Bear. All right. So now we're going to read chapter 16, and it's called A Thief in the Night. <clears throat> JJ thinks it is Bilbo. Is the thief? We will find out very shortly. All right. So, now the days passed slowly and wearily. Many of the dwarves spent their time piling and ordering the treasure, and now Thorin spoke of the Arkenstone of Thrain and bade them eagerly to look for it in every corner. For the Arkenstone of my father, he said, is worth more than the river of gold in itself, and to me it is beyond price. The stone of all the treasure I name unto myself, and I will be avenged on any one who finds it and withholds it. Bilbo heard these words and grew afraid, wondering what would happen if the stone was found wrapped in an old bundle of tattered oddments that he used as a pillow. All the same, he did not speak of it, for as the weariness of the days grew heavier, the beginnings of a plan had come into his little head. Things had gone on like this for some time when the ravens brought news that Dain had and more than five hundred dwarves hurrying from the Iron Hills were now within about two days' march of Dale, coming from the northeast. But they cannot reach the mountain unmarked, said Roark, and I fear lest there be battle in the valley. I do not call this council good. Though they are a grim folk, they are not likely to come to overcome the host that besets you. And even if they did so, what will you gain? Winter and snow is hastening behind them. How shall you be fed without the friendship and good will of the lands about you? The treasure is likely to be your death, though the dragon is no more. But Thorin was not moved. Winter and snow shall bite both men and elves, he said, and they may find their dwelling in their waste and in the waste grievous to bear. With my friends behind them and winter upon them, they will perhaps be in softer mood to parley with. That night Bilbo made up his mind. The sky was black and moonless. As soon as it was full dark, he went to a corner of an inner chamber just within the gate and drew from his bundle a rope and also the Arkenstone wrapped in a rag. Then he climbed to the top of the wall. Only Bomber was there, for it was his turn to watch, and the dwarves kept only one watchman at a time. It is mighty cold, said Bomber. I wish we could have a fire up here, as they have in the camp. It is warm enough inside, said Bilbo. I dare say I am bound here till midnight, grumbled the fat dwarf. I is a sorry business altogether. Not that I venture to disagree with Thorin. May, my, may his beard grow ever longer, yet he was ever a dwarf with a stick, with a stiff neck. Not as stiff as my legs, said Bilbo. I am tired of stairs and stone passages. I would give a good deal for the feel of grass at my toes. I would give a good deal for the feel of a strong drink in my throat, and for a soft bed after a good supper. I can't give you those while the siege is going on, but it is long since I watched, and I will take your turn for you if you like. There is no sleep in me tonight. You're a good fellow, Mr. Baggins, and I will take your offer kindly. If there should be anything to note, rouse me first, mind you. I will lie in the inner chamber to the left, not far away. Off you go, said Bilbo. I will wake you at midnight, and you can wake the next watchman. As soon as Bomber had gone, Bilbo put on his ring, fastened his rope, slipped down over the wall, and was gone. He had about five hours before him. Bomber would would sleep, he could sleep at any time, and ever since the adventure in the forest he was always trying to recapture the beautiful dreams he had then. And all the others were busy with Thorin. It was unlikely that any, even Feely and Keeley, would come out on the wall until it was their turn. <clears throat> it was very dark, and the road after a while when he left the newly made path and it was very dark and the road after a while, 
when he left the newly made path and climbed down toward the lower course of the stream, was strange to him. At last he came to the bend where he had to cross the water, if he was to make for the camp as he wished. Let me... At last he came to the bend where he had to cross the water, if he was to make for the camp as he wished. The bed of the stream was there, shallow, but already broad, and, for, and fording it in the dark was not easy for the little hobbit. He was nearly across when he missed his footing on a round stone and fell into the cold water with a splash. He had barely scrambled out on the far bank, shivering and spluttering, when up came elves in the gloom with bright lanterns and searched for the cause of the noise. "'That was no fish!' one said. "'There was a spy about! Hide your lights! They will help him more than us if it is that queer little creature that is said to be their servant!' "'Servant, indeed,' snorted Bilbo, and in the middle of his snort he sneezed loudly, and the elves immediately gathered toward the light. "'Let's have a light,' he said. "'I am here if you want me,' and he slipped off his ring and popped from behind the rock. They seized him quickly, in spite of their surprise. "'Who are you? And are you the dwarves' hobbit? What are you doing?' "'How did you get so far past our sentinels?' they asked one after another." I am Mr. Bilbo Baggins, he answered, companion of Thorin, if you want to know. I know your king well by sight, though perhaps he doesn't know me to look at. But Bard will remember me, and it is Bard I particularly want to see. Indeed, said they, and what may, your, may be your business? We have a doorbell. That is an unusual thing because... Normally we do this at night, so apologize, and JJ is going to uh, let Jaden, it's now. probably Jaden, let Jaden know that we are doing the live stream right now, and that he'll be out afterwards as long as he's good, because that was the agreement. And now he's supposed to be coming he's, back. He's come back, he just didn't want to let the door go. We are waiting. How's everyone doing today? Rebecca, how are you doing today? I'm tired. Mom says she's tired. Okay, Daniel, that's enough. Oh, no. Now that's in my head. Daniel! Working on math. I took a test this morning. I did poorly. Just got out of work. Okay, JJ is back. And now we're... Is gone. Daniel, you can be quiet. Is Edmund and his brother and his sister and Jaden is everybody. And Logan and Jaden. It's the whole posse. I didn't see Logan and Jaden. But... All right, so let's get back to the Hobbit. And uh, when we do the, um, when I post this on YouTube, I might try to uh, just sure. remove this little clip. Um, all right. Are we, are we ready now, please? Okay. I am Mr. Bilbo Baggins, he answered, companion of Thorin, if you want to know. I know your king well by sight, though perhaps he doesn't know me to look at. But Bard will remember me, and it is Bard I particularly want to see. Indeed, said they, and what may be your business? Whatever it is, it's my own, my good elves. But if you wish ever to get back to your own woods from this cold, cheerless place, he answered, shivering, you will take me along quick to a fire where I can dry, and then you will let me speak to your chiefs as quickly as may be. I have only an hour or two to spare. That is how it came about. 
that some two hours after his escape from the gate, Bilbo was sitting beside a warm fire in front of a large tent, and there sat too, gazing curiously at him, both the elven king and bard. A hobbit in elvish armor, partly wrapped in an old blanket, was something new to them. Really, you know, Bilbo was saying in his best business manner, things are impossible. Personally, I am tired of the whole affair. I wish I was back in the West in my own home, where folk are more reasonable. But I have an interest in this matter, one fourteenth share to be precise, according to a letter which fortunately I believe I have kept. He drew from a pocket in his old jacket, which he still wore over his mail. Crumpled and much folded, Thorin's letter had been put under the cloak, under the clock in his mantelpiece in May. A share of the profits, mind you, he went on. I am aware of that. Personally, I am only too ready to consider all your claims carefully and deduct what is right from the total before putting in my own claim. However, you don't know Thorin Oakenshield as well as I do now. I assure you he is quite ready to sit on a heap of gold and starve as long as you sit here. Well, let him, said Bard. Such a fool deserves to starve. "'Quite so,' said Bilbo. "'I see your point of view. "'At the same time, winter is coming on fast. "'Before long you will be having snow and what not, "'and supplies will be difficult, even for elves, I imagine. "'Also, there will be other difficulties. "'You have not heard of Dain and the dwarves of the Iron Hills?' "'We have a long time ago, but what has he got to do with us?' "'asked the king. "'I thought as much. "'I see I have some information you have not got. Dain. I may tell you, is now less than two days' march off, and has at least five hundred grim dwarves with him. A good many of them have had experience in the dreadful dwarf and goblin wars, of which you are no doubt you have no doubt heard. When they arrive, there may be serious trouble. Why do you tell us this? Are you betraying your friends, or are you threatening us? asked Bard grimly. "'My dear Bard,' squeaked Bilbo, "'don't be so hasty. "'I never met such, a, such, such suspicious folk. <sighs> um, "'I am merely trying to avoid trouble for all concerned. "'Now I will make you an offer. "'Let us hear it,' they said. "'You may see it,' said he. "'It is this.' "'And he drew forth the Arkenstone "'and threw away the wrapping.' The elven king himself, whose eyes were used to things of wonder and beauty, stood up in amazement. Even Bard gazed, marveling at it in silence. It was as if a globe had been filled with moonlight and hung before them in a net woven uh, the glint of frosty stars. This is the Arkenstone of Thrain, said Bilbo, the heart of the mountain, and it is also the heart of Thorin. He values it above a river of gold. I give it to you. It will aid you in your bargaining. Then Bilbo, not without a shudder, not without a glance of longing, handed the marvelous stone to Bard, and he held it in his hand as though dazed. But how is it yours to give? he asked at last with an effort. Oh, well, said the hobbit uncomfortably, it isn't exactly, but, well, I am willing to let it stand against all my claim. Don't you know, I may be a burglar, or so they say, personally, I never really felt like one, but I am an honest one. I hope, more or less. Anyway, I am going back now, and the dwarves can do what they like, what they like to me. I hope you will find it useful." The elven king looked at Bilbo with a new wonder. Bilbo Baggins, he said, you are more worthy to wear the armor of elf princes than many that have looked more comely in it. But I wonder if Thorin Oakenshield will see it so. I have more knowledge of dwarves in general than you have, perhaps. I advise you to remain with us, and here you shall be honored and thrice welcome." "'Thank you very much, I am sure,' said Bilbo, with a bow. "'But I don't think I ought to leave my friends like this. "'After all, we have gone through together. "'And I promised to wake old Bomber at midnight, too. "'Really, I must be going, and quickly. 
Nothing they could say would stop him, so an escort was provided for him, and as he went, both the king and bard saluted him with honor. As they passed through the camp, an old man, wrapped in a dark cloak, rose from the tent, from a tent door where he was sitting, and came toward them. "'Well done, Mr. Baggins,' he said, clapping Bilbo on the back. "'There is always more about you than anyone expects.' It was Gandalf. For the first time, for many a day, Bilbo was really delighted. But there was no time for all the questions that he immediately wished to ask. "'All in good time,' said Gandalf. "'Things are drawing toward the end now, unless I am mistaken. "'There is an unpleasant time just in front of you, but keep your heart up. "'You may come through it all right. "'There is news brewing that even the ravens have not heard. "'Good night.' Puzzled but cheered, Bilbo hurried on. He was guided to a safe ford and set across dry, and then he said farewell to the elves and climbed carefully back toward the gate. Great weariness began to come over him, but it was well before midnight when he clambered up the rope again. It was still where he had left it. He untied it and hid it, and then he sat down on the wall and wondered anxiously what would happen next. At midnight he woke up Bomber, and then in turn rolled himself in his, uh, in his corner without listening to the old dwarf's thanks, which he felt he had hardly earned. He was soon fast asleep, forgetting all his worries till the morning. As a matter of fact, he was dreaming of eggs and bacon. Chapter 17 The Clouds Burst Next day, the trumpets rang early in the camp. Soon, a single runner was seen hurrying along the narrow path. At a distance, he stood and hailed them, asking whether Thorin would now listen to another embassy, since new tidings had, had come to hand, and ma matters were changed. "'That will be Dain, said Thorin, when he heard. "'They will have not got wind of his coming. "'I thought that would alter their mood.' "'Bid them come few in number and weaponless, and I will hear,' he called to the messenger. "'About midday the banners of the forest and the lake were seen to be borne forth again. "'A company of twenty was approaching. "'At the beginning of the narrow way they laid aside sword and spear and came on toward the gate. "'Wondering, the dwarves saw that among them were both Bard and the elven king, "'before whom an old man wrapped in cloak and Hood bore a strong casket of iron-bound wood. "'Hail, Thorin!' said Bard. "'Are you still of the same mind?' "'My mind does not change with the rising and setting of a few suns,' answered Thorin. "'Did you come to ask me idle questions? "'Still the elf-host has not departed as I bade. "'Till then you come in vain to bargain with me. "'Is there then nothing for which you would yield any of your gold?' "'Nothing that you or your friends have to offer. "'What of the Arkenstone of Thrain?' said he. "'And at the same moment the old man opened the casket "'and held aloft the jewel. "'The light leapt from his hand, bright and white in the morning. "'Then Thorin was stricken dumb with amazement and confusion. "'No one spoke for a long while.' Thorin at length broke the silence, and his voice was thick with wrath. "'That stone was my father's and is mine,' he said. "'Why should I purchase my own?' But wonder overcame him, and he added, "'But how came you by the heirloom of my house, "'if there is need to ask such a question of thieves?' "'We are not thieves,' Bard answered. "'Your own we will give back in return for our own.' "'How came you by it?' shouted Thorin, in gathering rage. "'I gave it to them,' squeaked Bilbo, who was peering over the wall by now, by now in a dreadful fright. "'You? You?' said Thorin, uh, turning upon him and gasping him, grasping him with both hands. "'You miserable hobbit! You undersized burglar!' he shouted at a loss for words, and he shook poor Bilbo like a rabbit. "'By the beard of Durin, I wish I had Gandalf here.' "'Curse him for the choice of you. "'May his beard wither. "'As for you, I will throw you to the rocks,' he cried, "'and lifted Bilbo in his arms. "'Stay!' 
"'Your wish is granted,' said a voice. The old man with the casket threw aside his hood and cloak. "'Here is Gandalf, and none too soon, it seems. "'If you don't like my burglar, please don't damage him. "'Put him down and listen first to what he has to say.' "'You all seem in league,' said Thorin, dropping Bilbo on top of the wall. "'Never again will I have dealings with any wizard or his friends.' "'What have you to say, you descendant of rats?' "'Dear me, dear me,' said Bilbo, "'I am sure this is all very uncomfortable. "'You may remember saying that I might choose my own fourteenth share. "'Perhaps I took it too literally. "'I have been told that dwarves are sometimes politer in word than in deed. "'The time was all the same when you seemed to think "'that I had been of some service.' "'Descended of rats, indeed. "'Is this all the service of you and your family that I was promised, Thorin? "'Take it that I have disposed, disposed of my share as I wished, and let it go at that.' "'I will,' said Thorin grimly, "'and I will let you go at that, and may we never meet again.' "'Then he turned and spoke over the wall. "'I am betrayed,' he said. "'It was rightly guessed that I could not forbear "'to redeem the Arkenstone, the treasure of my house. "'For it I will give one fourteenth share "'of the hoard in silver and gold, "'setting aside the gems. "'But that shall be accounted the promised share of this traitor. "'And with that reward he shall depart, "'and you can divide it as you will. "'He will get little enough, I doubt it, I doubt not. Take him if you wish him to live, and no friendship of mine goes with him. Get down. Get down now to your friends, he said to Bilbo, or I will throw you down. What about the gold and silver, asked Bilbo. That shall follow after, as can be arranged, said he. Get down. Until then, we keep the stone, cried Bard. You are not making... "'You are not making a very splendid figure as king under the mountain,' said Gandalf. "'But things may change yet.' "'They may indeed,' said Thorin, and already so strong was the bewilderment of the treasure upon him, he was pondering whether by the help of Dain he might not recapture the Arkenstone and without the share of the reward. And so Bilbo was swung down from the wall and departed with nothing for all his trouble except the armor which Thorin had given him already. More than one of the dwarves in their hearts felt shame and pity at his going. Farewell, they cried to him. We may meet again as friends. Be off, called Thorin. You have mail upon you, which was made by my folk, and is too good for you. It cannot be pierced by arrows, but if you do not hasten, I will sting your miserable feet. So be swift. Not so hasty, said Bard. We will give you until tomorrow. At noon we will return and see if you have brought from the hoard the portion that is to be set against the stone. If that is done without deceit, then we will depart, and the elf host will go back to the forest. In the meanwhile, farewell. With that they went back to the camp, but Thorin sent messengers by Roach, telling Dain of what had passed, and bidding him come with wary speed. That day passed, and the night. The next day the wind shifted west, and the air was dark and gloomy. The morning was still early when a cry was heard in the camp. Runners came in to report that a host of dwarves had appeared round the eastern spur of the mountain, and was now hastening toward Dale. Dain had come. He had hurried on through the night, and so had come upon them sooner than they had expected. Each one of his folk was clad in a hauberk of steel mail that hung to his knees, and his legs were covered with hose of a fine and flexible metal mesh, the secret of whose making was possessed by Dain's people. The dwarves were are exceedingly strong for their height, but most of these were strong even for dwarves. In battle they wielded heavy two-handed mattocks, but each of them had also a short broad sword at his side and a round shield slung at his back. Their beards were forked and plaited and thrust into belts. Their caps were of iron and they were shod with iron, and their faces were grim." 
trumpets called men and elves to arms. Before long, the dwarves could be seen coming up the valley at a great pace. They halted between the river and the eastern spur, but a few held on their way, and crossing the river drew near the camp, and there they laid down their weapons and held up their hands in sign of peace. Bard went out to meet them, and with him went Bilbo. "'We are sent from Dain, son of Nain, they said when questioned. We are hastening to our kinsmen of the mountain, since we, le since we learn that the kingdom of old is renewed. But who are you that sit in the plain as foes before defended walls? This, of course, is the polite and rather old-fashioned language of such occasion meant simply, You have no business here. We are going on, so make way, or we shall fight you. They meant to push on between the mountain and the loop of the river, for the narrow land there did not seem to be strongly guarded. Bard, of course, refused to allow the dwarves to go straight on to the mountain. He was determined to wait until the gold and silver had been brought out in exchange for the Arkenstone, for he did not believe that this would be done if once the fortress was manned with so large and warlike a company. They had brought with them a great store of supplies, for the dwarves can carry very heavy burdens, and nearly all of Dain's folk, in spite of their rapid march, bore huge packs on their backs in addition to their weapons. They would stand a siege for weeks, and by that time yet more dwarves might come, and yet more for Thorin had many relatives. Also, they would be able to reopen and guard some other gate, so that the besiegers would have to encircle the whole mountain, and for that they had not sufficient numbers. These were, in fact, precisely their plans, for the raven messengers had been busy between Thorin and Dain, but, but for the moment the way was barred, so after angry words the dwarf messengers retired, muttering in their beards, Bard then sent messengers at once to the gate, but they found no gold or payment. Arrows came forth as soon as they were within a shot, and they hastened back in dismay. In the camp, was, in the camp all was now astir, as if for battle, for the dwarves of Dain were advancing along the eastern bank. Fools, laughed Bard, to come thus beneath the mountain's arm. They do not understand war above ground, whatever they may know of, of a... Of battle in the mines, there are many of our archers and spearmen now hidden in the rocks upon their right flank. Dwarf mail may be good, but they will soon be hard put to it. Let us set on them now from both sides before they are fully rested. But the elven king said, Long will I tarry ere I begin this war for gold. The dwarves cannot pass us unless we will or do unless we will, or do anything that we cannot m mark. Let us hope still for, the, for something that will bring reconciliation. Our advantage in numbers will be enough, if in the end it must come to unhappy blows. But he reckoned without the dwarves. The knowledge that the Arkenstone was in the hands of the besiegers burned in their thoughts, also, they guessed the hesitation of Bard and his friends, and resolved to strike while they debated. Suddenly, without a signal, they sprang silently forward to attack. Bows twanged and arrows whistled. Battle was about to be joined. Still, more suddenly, a darkness came on with dreadful swiftness. A black cloud hurried over the sky, Winter thunder on a wild wind rolled roaring up and rumbled in the mountain, and lightning lit its peak. And beneath the thunder another blackness could be seen whirling forward. But it did not come with the wind. It came from the north like a vast cloud of birds, so dense that no light could be seen between their wings. Halt! cried Gandalf, who appeared suddenly and stood alone with arms uplifted between the advancing dwarves and the ranks awaiting them. Halt! he called in a voice like thunder, and his staff blazed forth with a flash like lightning. Dread will come upon you all. Alas! 
It has come more swiftly than I guessed. The goblins are upon you. Bolg of the north is coming. O oh, Dain, whose father you slew in Moria, behold, the bats are above in army, above his army like a sea of locusts. They ride upon wolves and wargs are in their train. Amazement and confusion fell upon them all. Even as Gandalf had been speaking, the darkness grew. The dwarves halted and gazed in the sky. The elves cried out with many voices. Come, called Gandalf. There is yet time for counsel. Let Dain, son of Nain, come swiftly to us. So began a battle that none had expected, and it was called the Battle of Five Armies, and it was very terrible. Upon one side were the goblins and the wild wolves, and upon one, upon the other were elves and men and dwarves. This is how it fell out. Ever since the fall of the great goblin of the Misty Mountains, the hatred of their race for the dwarves had been rekindled to fury. Messengers had passed to and fro between all their cities, colonies, and strongholds, for they resolved now to win the dominion of the north. Tidings they had gathered in secret ways, and in all the mountains there was a forging and an arming. Then they marched and gathered by hill and valley, going ever by tunnel or under dark, until around and beneath the great mountain Gundabad of the north, where was their capital, a vast host was assembled, ready to sweep down in time of storm unawares upon the south. Then they learned the death of smog, and joy was in their hearts, and they hastened night and night, night after night, through the mountains, and came thus at last on a sudden, but from the north, came thus at last on a sudden from the north, hard on the heels of Dain. Not even the ravens knew of their coming until they came out in the broken lands which divided the lonely mountain from the hills behind. How much Gandalf knew cannot be said, but it is plain that he had not expected this sudden assault. This is the plan that he made in council with the elven king, and with Bard, and with Dain, for the dwarf lord now joined them. The goblins were the foes of all, and at their coming all the other quarrels were forgotten. Their only hope was to lure the goblins into the valley between the arms of the mountain, and themselves to man the great spurs that struck south and east. Yet this would have been would be perilous if the goblins were in sufficient numbers to overrun the mountain itself and so attack them also from behind and above. But there was no time to make any other plan or to summon any help. Soon the thunder passed, rolling away to the southeast. But the bat cloud came flying lower over the shoulder of the mountain and whirled above them, shutting out the light and filling them with dread. To the mountain, called Bard. To the mountain, let us take our places while there is yet time. On the southern spur, in its lower slopes, and, the, and in the rocks at its feet, the elves were set. On the eastern spur were men and dwarves, but Bard and some of the nimblest of men and elves climbed to the height of the eastern shoulder to gain a view of the north. Soon they could see the lands before the mountain's feet back black with a hurrying multitude ere long the vanguard swirled round the spur's end and came rushing into dale these were the swiftest wolf riders and already their cries and howls rent the air afar a few brave men were strung before them to make a feint of resistance and many there fell before the rest drew back and fled to either side as gandalf had hoped the goblin army had gathered behind the resisted vanguard and poured now in rage into the valley, driving wildly up between the arms of the mountain, seeking for their foe. Their banners were countless, black and red, and they came on like a tide in fury and disorder. It was a terrible battle, the most dreadful of all Bilbo's experiences, and the one which at the time he hated most— which is to say it was the one he was most proud of and most fond of recalling long afterward, although he was quite unimportant in it. 
actually, I may say he put on his ring early in the business, and vanished from sight, if not from all danger. A magic ring of that sort is not a complete protection in a goblin charge, nor does it stop flying arrows and wild spears, but it does help in getting out of the way, and it prevents your head from being specially chosen for a sweeping stroke by a goblin swordsman. The elves were the first to charge. Their hatred for the goblins is cold and bitter. Their spears and swords shone in the gloom with a gleam of chill flame. So deadly was the wrath of the hands that held them. As soon as their as the host of their enemies was dense in the valley, they sent against it a shower of arrows, and each flickered as it fled, as if with a stinging fire. Behind the arrows a thousand of their spearsmen leapt out and charged. The yells were deafening, the rocks were stained black with goblin blood. Just as the goblins were recovering from the onslaught and the elf charge was halted, there rose from across the valley a deep-throated roar, with cries of Moria and Dain, Dain, the dwarves of the Iron Hills plunged in, wielding their mattocks upon the other side, and beside them came the men of the lake with long swords. Panic came upon the goblins, and even as they turned to meet this new attack, the elves charged again with renewed numbers. Already many of the goblins were flying back down the river to escape from the trap, and many of their own wolves were turning upon them and rending the dead and the wounded. Victory seemed at hand when a cry rang out on the heights above. Goblins had scaled the mountain from the other side and were already many were on the slopes above the gate and others were streaming down recklessly, heedless of those that fell streaming, excuse me, those that fell screaming from cliff and precipice to attack the spurs from above. Each of these could be reached by paths that ran down from the main mass of the mountain in the center and the defenders that had too few to bar the way for long. Victory now vanished from hope. They had only stemmed the first onslaught of the black tide. Day drew on. The goblins gathered again in the valley. There was a host of wargs came ravening, and with them came the bodyguard of Bolg, goblins of huge size with scimitars of steel. Soon actual darkness was coming into a stormy sky, while still the, the great bats swirled about the heads and ears of elves and men, of fastened vampire-like on their stricken. Now Bard was fighting to defend the eastern spur, and yet giving slowly back and the elf lords were at bay about their king upon the southern arm near to the watch post of Raven Hill. Suddenly there was a great shout, and from the gate came a trumpet call. They had forgotten Thorin. Part of the wall, moved by levers, fell outward with a crash into the pool. Out leapt the king under the mountain, and his companions followed him. Hood and cloak were gone. They were in shining armor, and red light leapt from their eyes. In the gloom, the great dwarf gleamed like gold in a dying fire. Rocks were hurled down from on high by the goblins above, but they held on, leapt down to the fall's foot, and rushed forward to battle. Wolf and rider fell or fled before them. Thorin wielded his axe with mighty strokes, and nothing seemed to harm the harm him. To me, to me, elves and men, to me, oh my kinfolk, he cried. And his voice shook like a horn in the valley. Down, heedless of order, rushed all the dwarves of Dain to his help. Down, too, came many of the lake men, for Bard could not restrain them, and out upon the other side came many of the spearmen of the elves. Once again the goblins were stricken in the valley, and they were piled up in heaps till till Dale was dark and hideous with their corpses. The wargs were scatter scattered, and Thorin drove right against the bodyguard of Bolg, but he could not pierce their ranks. Already behind him, among the goblin dead, lay many men and many dwarves, and many a fair elf that should have lived yet long ages merrily in the wood. And as the valley widened, his onset grew ever slower. His numbers were too few. His flanks were 
were unguarded. Soon the attacks were the attackers were attacked, and they were forced into a great ring, facing every way, hemmed all about with goblins and wolves returning to the assault. The bodyguard of Bulg came howling against them and drove in upon their ranks like waves upon cliffs of sand. Their friends could not help them, for the assault from the mountain was renewed with redoubled force, and upon either side men and elves were being slowly beaten down. On all this Bilbo looked with misery. He had taken his stand on Raven Hill among the elves, partly because there was more chance of escape from that paint from that point and partly with the more tookish part of his mind because if he was going to be in that in a last desperate stand he preferred on the whole to defend the elven king gandalf too i may say was there sitting on the ground as if in deep thought preparing i suppose some last blast of magic before the end that did not seem far off it will not be long now thought bilbo before the goblins win the gate and we are all slaughtered or driven down and captured. Really, it is enough to make one weep after all one has gone through. I would rather old Smog had been left with all the wretched treasure than that these vile creatures should get it, and poor old Bomber and Balin and Feely and Keeley and all the rest come to a bad end, and Bard too, and the lake men and merry elves, misery me. I have heard songs of many battles, and I have always understood that defeat may be glorious. It seems very uncomfortable, not to say distressing. I wish I was well out of it. The clouds were torn by the wind, and a red sunset slashed the west. Seeing the sudden gleam in the gloom of, sorry, in the gloom Bilbo looked around. He gave a great cry. He had seen a sight that made his heart leap. Dark shapes, small yet majestic against the distant glow. The eagles, he shouted. The eagles! The eagles are coming! Bilbo's eyes were seldom wrong. The eagles were coming, down the wind, line after line, in such a host as must have gathered from all the, all the iries of the north. The eagles, the eagles, Bilbo cried, dancing and waving his arms. If the elves could not see him, they could hear him. Soon they too look, took up the cry, and it echoed across the valley. Many wondering eyes looked up though as yet nothing could be seen except from the southern shoulder of the mountain. The eagles! cried Bilbo once more, but at that moment a stone hurtling from above smote heavily on his helm, and he fell with a crash and knew no more. Goodness, okay. I wish that I had Hobbit sight tomorrow at the range. Um, Again. I might have some trouble seeing some of my targets. So. Again. You want me to read that chapter again? No. I'm saying again. <laughs> because he just got he just got knocked out again. And yeah. Remembered nothing. It's, it is what it is. All right. So we have two chapters left in this book um, in which Bilbo comes to a miserable end. And um, I'm sure he will be slain and all will be lost. Um, so you'll have to tune in tonight to find out what really happens. And um, God bless you. Have a good afternoon. We will be starting um, sometime between 8 and 8.30, just like we normally do. And God bless you. Have a good afternoon. Okay.